Good morning, friends. It's Steve from Southern Illinois again. It's an absolutely gorgeous day down here. We had a storm came through last night, and amazingly, this morning dawned cool, uh, and the sweltering heat is gone, at least for a while. <clears throat> the birds are singing, and none of the neighbors are mowing their grass. <laughs> it's an amazing morning. It was Friday, August 17th, 1945. Mary Taylor was 12 years old, and she was in the hospital. Her bed, a bare mattress, laid across the top of three steamer trunks. She was in what served as the hospital for the Wei Fang uh, civilian internment camp in North China. Diarrhea had left her dehydrated and weak. The high humidity and scorching heat only added to her misery. <clears throat> and the hospital had no IV fluids. They had no medications. The best the nurses could do for her was to spoon broth in small amounts into her mouth. Today we would call that oral re rehydration therapy, and it's a life-saving approach. But she was miserable. Five and a half years earlier, when she was less than seven, she and her three siblings had been attending the boarding school that had been set up for the children of missionaries who were serv serving in inland rural China. Then Pearl Harbor was bombed. <clears throat> and Mary and her three brothers and sisters had been rounded up with the entire rest of the school, teachers, students, had marched into the internment camp as enemy aliens. They hadn't had an opportunity to communicate with their parents. For five and a half years, there'd been no communication between them. They didn't know if they were dead or alive. Their parents didn't know if they were dead or alive. Now, this internment camp was not one of those horror stories that you read about, like uh, Auschwitz. They were on half rations, but the food arrived predictably. The meat wasn't always fresh, and the vegetables were often starting to rot by the time they arrived. <clears throat> but it wasn't horrible. <laughs> of course, there is that's all a frame of reference, okay? This is the same internment camp that Eric Lydell of Chariots of Fire fame was interned in. And there's this story of him that I've read from multiple sources. One breakfast, uh, he'd been out working and he got there late and uh, they gave him his bowl of breakfast. Now breakfast was sorghum. Here in the US we call it millet. Um, we, we use it as bird seed, but for centuries it has been the food of, been a staple crop in many civilizations. But when you cook it, it basically turns into these rubbery little balls that you have to chew and chew and chew. <clears throat> well, as um, Eric was starting to eat his sorghum, he noticed weevils in it. So he started carefully picking the weevils out and setting them at the, to the side. When he finished picking the weevils out, his bowl was only half full. And he asked the cooks if he could have some more, and they said, 
I'm sorry that was we scraped the bottom of, bottom of the pan for you. So nonchalantly, he picked up all the weevils, put them back in into his um, sorghum, and ate them up and quipped to the nurses, "Well, looks like I got extra protein this morning." Okay, weevils are a uh, basically a time a time measurement for missionaries. Uh, if you see them and you scream, you're a newbie. Uh, if you see them and you pick them out, then you're experienced. If you see them and you start eating them, you've been there too long. Okay. So, when I say it wasn't a horrible situation, what I mean is these were not emaciated, starving, dying uh, prisoners but they were living in a hardship post. But besides the fact that they had food, uh, the internees had been allowed to bring their own possessions with them. So the Salvation Army missionaries had brought their musical instruments. And so there were co band concerts every week. And if you wanted to, they, they would give you music lessons. Teachers had been allowed to bring bring the textbooks that they could carry. Not everything, but they had textbooks. They had some supplies, and so there were schools for the children. Okay, these were administrators and businessmen. They had immediately organized the camp uh, so that the, all of the basic functions of a community were were immediately set up. Okay. It could have been a lot worse. Uh, Mary is laying on her bed, her mattress, in the hospital, when suddenly she hears the drone of an airplane outside. Now this was an uncommon event. Sometimes they would see airplanes way up in the sky, but this airplane sounded close. It sounded low. And that was not common. Sweating and barefoot, she leaped off her mattress and raced to the window. To her surprise, when she looked out the window, people were just acting crazy out in the courtyard. Okay, some were jumping up and down, others were running in circles, men were stripping off their shirts and waving them in the sky, some men were pumping their fists in victory, women were hugging each other or dancing for joy. <laughs> she looked up and the plane was low enough that she could see stars on the underside of the wings. It was an American plane. And she understand the joy. They all knew that the war had been not going well for the Japanese. They had illicit contact with resistance fighters in the, the, the countryside. And so they knew things were not going well. But there was an American plane. And it's flying over, and the people are are rejoicing. They think they're coming for us, and they're waving their waving their shirts, trying to get their attention. And then all of a sudden, the plane turns, and starts starts circling back. And if she thought the adults were going crazy before, now absolute pandemonium broke out. This plane circled lower, and they could see the faces of the pilots, and the pilots were waving at them. They had been seen. They knew they were there. Suddenly, the underbelly of the plane opened up. This was a B-24 bomber, and the underbelly of the plane opened up. Well, you know what's in bombers, right? And everybody just kind of froze in the courtyard apprehensive what was going to happen but instead of bombs dropping out of the Bombay drawers doors seven red silk parachutes suddenly plummeted out of the doors opened up and seven soldiers started floating down to the earth instinctively the entire camp 
turned as one and rushed towards the gates. Forgetting about the electrified barbed wire, forgetting about the machine guns, forgetting about the guards with their bayonets, forgetting about everything except that liberation was at hand. The guards must have been as startled as they were because not a shot was fired and the crowd crashed through the gates and streamed out into the fields of millet that surrounded the camp. The parachutes came down about a mile away from the camp before they even touched the ground. The first of the internees was there and they hoisted these soldiers up on their shoulders and started a triumphant parade back to the internment camp. <laughs> the soldiers were absolutely shocked. This was a special forces squad. They had been behind enemy lines for three to four years, um, organizing guerrilla resistance activities, sabotaging uh, Japanese communication and logistical lines, um, rescuing downed uh, pilots and air crew. They had been living in danger for years. And they had come on this mission to rescue these people, not knowing what they were, that they were up against. They had minimal armament. They were heavily trained, but very lightly armed and they did not know what they were getting into and to be re greeted with this kind of a reception and now they're being rushed in a grand parade towards the barbed wire fence towards the guard towers they can see machine guns positioned above them they start getting really apprehensive and they insist that the people put them down and warily with weapons drawn they start to approach the gate and then suddenly, as if on cue, the Salvation, the Salvation Army band strikes up a stirring march and comes marching out the gate. Followed behind them is the uh, uh, internee organization committee, the 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 interns who internees who were in who had organized the camp, the leaders of the camp, and they gave them an official welcome and then escorted them into the camp and into the office of the commandant where the Japanese officers were waiting for them. The soldiers were absolutely shocked. They were still tense. They go into the office and there are the the two commandants. One is political uh, in charge of po the political aspects and the other is in charge of the military and they're very stoic and calm and in the next 20 minutes the two parties calmly and rationally negotiated the transfer of the camp. Two days before the armistice uh, had been signed and the Japanese had surrendered unconditionally but that word had not reached the camp, either the soldiers, the guards, or the internees. They negotiated the transfer, the Japanese soldiers surrendered their weapons, and then the celebration began. This is such an alien experience for me that it's, it's hard for me to e even imagine the joy, the thrill that those people ex ex experienced. And yet, if you go online, you will find a website and you will find multiple first-hand uh, recollections of internees who can still remember details of that experience. Last week I introduced you to what I asserted was the central prophecy 
of what I'm calling the big P prophecies of the Bible. And when I say big P prophecy, I'm talking about the arc of prophecy that that touches on the major points of history. And it starts in Daniel's day and and continues on to the end of this world's history as we know it. The dream of Nebuchadnezzar anchors history at six points. We have the Babylonian Empire, the Kingdom of Gold, its successor, the Kingdom of Silver, its successor, the Kingdom of Bronze, its successor, the Kingdom of Iron, and then we have a period of chaos where the Blue Jays are excited about something. A period of chaos where no nation is dominant and they're struggling. Some are weak and some are strong. And finally we have the setting up of the kingdom of God. The big P prophecies of the Bible, for the most part, go over the same territory, the same key points, repeatedly refining the picture, looking at it from different angles, using different symbols, but always following this arc. The second one, the next in the Big P Prophecies, is found in Daniel chapter 7. Okay. Four beasts represent the four nations this time. One is a lion, one is like a bear, the third is like a leopard, and the fourth, Daniel couldn't describe. If anything, we'd call it a monster or an alien. Okay. Then comes a period of, of confusion um, and, and contests. No, no power dominating fully. And finally, the kingdom of heaven is established. Now, I encourage you to go to the Bible, read it for yourself, okay? Because this is the heart and core of prophecy. And if we're not familiar with it, we're consciously choosing to remain ignorant of what God was trying to communicate to us. But I want to especially focus your attention on verses 13 and 14, because they add a detail that's critical to our understanding of what lies ahead and is critical to this touchstone of spirituality, of a meaningful life. Now I'm going to read the verses 13 and 14 from the contemporary English version. As I continued to watch the vision that night, I saw what looked like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he was presented to the eternal God. He was crowned king and given glory and power so that all people of every nation and every race would serve him. He will rule forever and his kingdom is eternal, never to be destroyed. Now the last words of that chapter would have been very familiar to Daniel. David had been told that his throne would last forever, that his descendants would continue to lead Israel forever. Now, as long as they followed God, his blessing would be upon them. If they didn't follow of God, his blessing would be removed and they would go into captivity. But God would not abandon them. God would not abandon them. This is critical for us to remember. Okay? Isaiah and the other prophets who had preceded Daniel had used very similar language to describe the coming of the Messiah who would lead Israel back from apostasy both into righteousness and into national glory. That part would have been familiar to Daniel. But the first part, this part about a son of man, a, a being that looks like a human, that appears to be a human, 
coming with the clouds of heaven? This was new. And in fact, this is the only place in the Old Testament where this imagery is used. But Jesus applied that several times to himself. Jesus quoted Daniel repeatedly, mentioning a future event where he would come in the clouds. Matthew 24 is, is the prime example. This is another one of the big P prophecies. It doesn't go over the entire arc of history. It, instead, it focuses on the events leading up to when the kingdom of God is established, which is what the disciples had asked. That's the question Jesus was answering when he was talking about to them. In verses 29 to 31 of Matthew 24, Jesus says these, these things. Right after those days of suffering, the language in the, in the King James is that time of tribulation. Right after the tribulation, the sun will become dark, the moon will no longer shine, the stars will fall, and the powers in the sky will be shaken. Then a sign will appear in the sky, and there will be the Son of Man. All nations on earth will weep when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. At the sound of a loud trumpet, he will send his angels to bring his chosen ones together from all over the earth. The New Testament picture drawn in the Gospels, the writings of Paul, Revelation, of Jesus coming in the clouds, stands on the prophetic foundation of Daniel 17, 7, 13, and 14. There's no discontinuity in the Bible. There's a single arc of prophecy starting with the Old Testament and going continuously through the New. The return of Jesus is the foundation of the Christian faith. Sometimes you'd think we were focused more on the resurrection and the crucifixion from the way we talk about it. But the reality is that those events are meaningless if Jesus doesn't come back, if Jesus isn't coming back. That's the basis of our hope and the basis for optimism and perseverance. And that is the foundation of the strength that this touchstone brings to our spiritual lives. We cannot let our current difficulties, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, the injustice, the evil in the world, define who we are or shift our focus over who we are called to be. Hope demands that we do more than survive, than adapt to our environment, than get by. It calls us to prepare. The people in the Waifang camp had no weapons. They could not free themselves. They were in the grasp of an enemy and helpless. But they were not without purpose. Because of their hope of liberation, they taught their children. They organized themselves. They worked together as a community for the common good rather than fighting over the scraps of food that they were given. They maintained their focus. And when their liberators came, they were ready. The reason the camp was surrendered peacefully was because the prisoners, the internees, had been organizing themselves. They had been having, their leadership had been co having conversations with the leadership of the guards. And the guards had decided 
that regardless of the orders that they received, they were not going to massacre the in inmates. And when the liberation came, <laughs> they, the uh, internees were ready for it. They were ready to go. Enthusiastic. Talk about an enthusiastic yes. This is an enthusiastic yes that is totally over the top. The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming. We have an Independence Day coming, friends. But not the kind of Independence Day that we celebrate here in America where our military prowess wins us victory. Not the kind of Independence Day that we, we, we show in movies. I'm thinking of Independence Day and Independence Day resurgence where the clouds in heaven open and down come monsters. And it's only by our determination and our resistance that we survive. That's not the kind of Independence Day that we face. We're facing an Independence Day where a Savior comes. Because we cannot fix the problems in this world. Once again, today is challenging for those of us who struggle with religion, who struggle with doubts. And I acknowledge that living our lives this way must feel somewhat impractical to you. We must survive, and life often feels like it's a full contact sport, that there's no one here to help us. If we don't do it ourselves, who's going to watch out for us? This world is full of injustice, pain, hatred. Life is not fair. And Jesus did not ignore these facts when he was here. He embraced them and transcended them. And that's what he calls you and I to do as well. His compassion, his love, his commitment sacrificially to caring for the people around him. Purpose and meaning require a future focus that turns surviving into thriving. And that is what I find in the promise of Jesus' return. And that's what I see in the lives of the people who embrace this promise in the Bible. Christians, most of you would say that you're waiting for Jesus to return. But I have a question for you. Is that belief grounded on the arc of Big P prophecy, which goes through the entire scripture? Or have you been taught to slice and dice the Bible and only pay attention to part of it? If you have, is your faith really grounded on the Word of God? Or are you holding on to a fragment which leads you open to winds of doctrine and uncertainty and relativism? Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But keep looking up. I'll see you next week. Oh, I may not see you next week. Uh, check back, okay? But uh, my dad's been ailing, and I need to go down and spend some time with him. So um, this week's going to be somewhat hectic. I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.